introduce our speaker, Javier Gomez Lavi, who is Assistant Professor of the Department of Philosophy at Purdue University. Javier got his uh, PhD at the University at CUNY uh, in uh, New York. He works mostly in the philosophy of cognitive science. He is extremely well known for his uh, work on working memory. We will hear more about that uh, today. He is also the director of the new Purdue Normativity and Cognition, PUNCS, and the, college, and the College of Liberal Arts, Virtual Reality, and Artificial Intelligence, VRAI Labs. Um, today, he will be talking about how to build a mind without working memory, a computational approach to cognitive architecture. Right now at the center, talk about the pragmatism of first and Brandom as a frame for modeling entrepreneurship. So we're looking forward, is the topic hasn't changed. No, it doesn't change. <laughs> so we will, uh, uh, are looking forward to this talk. Next uh, week, we are having the first conference of the semester on prediction and punishment cross disciplinary workshop on casserole AI, which starts on Friday morning. Uh, it's a three day conference. If you want to attend the conference, you must register. Uh, the uh, link for registration is on the website. So please go to the website and register. For the conference, we need to have a head count because uh, the rooms are actually not that big and we might not be able to welcome everyone who wants to come. So the deadline for registering is Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come to this conference, please go on the website and put your name uh, on, on uh, the registration form. Um, and the next annual lecture series where we bring um, uh, speakers to um, uh, PITS, to HPS, and uh, Philosophy at the Center is going to be given by uh, Maya Goldenberg on Friday, February 23rd at 3.30 p.m. on the 10th floor. And Maya will be talking about myth-busting or meaning-making, public science communication and the infodemic. Uh, you all are welcome to that talk. It will be followed by a reception after her, her lecture, as we always do. Uh, today, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Javier, who is an assistant professor at Purdue University. He is a visiting fellow at the center this semester. He got his PhD a few years ago uh, at CUNY with uh, Jesse uh, Prince. He works in the philosophy of cognitive science uh, with a connection to moral psychology, uh, as well as the philosophy of mind. He has interest in the philosophy of science as well. Uh, he, his main work, as you can see here, uh, Part of his main work, but the work maybe he's most famous for is for, for his work on uh, or infamous, as you will judge by yourself, uh, within the next hour, is uh, his work on uh, working memory. He has published in both scientific and philosophical journals, Neuroimage, Frontiers, Man and Language, Philosophical Botany, uh, Philosophical Psychology, Biology, and Philosophy. He has published uh, widely. And he's a director of the normativity and cognition, the lab, not the normativity and cognition, punks. So, Purdue normativity. Okay, uh, right. yeah, Purdue normative cognition, punks. punks lab. Very good. Uh, and the College of Liberal Arts, Virtual Reality and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Right. Right, you know, which is true, because you, your French is a little bit, it's a little bit efficient. So, uh, in any case, and today is going to be talking about working memory, which he told me is a basic idea behind the book he's actually working on, and we'll be developing our next year. Awesome. So it's yours. Thanks so much, everybody. I really appreciate seeing a bunch of familiar faces and new people, and I really want to get some feedback. This is a newer talk. I've never given it before. We're going to try to get it done in a minute. So bear with me if I go a little fast, because I want to get your feedback. So the whole title is something like, how do you build a mind without working memory? But actually, it had this whole, like, long post colon thing about like how to a computational approach to cognitive architecture we're going to get to that but really i kind of want to focus on the story behind this idea of like what does it mean to build a mind without working memory we're going to start with some brief overview about this kind of narrative i have of how cognitive architecture has been thought of i think for a long time we're going to go into the history where i think we can see models of mind that have something like working memory since we've ever started this process of coming up with models in mind. Then I'm gonna actually tell you what working memory is for those of you who don't know. Then I'm gonna to try to argue that Meh, it's not a good construct. I'm gonna kind of rehash an argument I've given many times. I'm gonna to try to argue instead of having a unitary construct of working memory, we might wanna look at coalitions 
of processes that are involved in maintaining and manipulating information. And I'm going to argue that we can find these coalitions by using uh, natural language processing and machine learning techniques. I'm going to get some examples, and we're going to talk about some limitations. So it's a lot to cover. So let's just dive in. Some overview, again, the gist here, the question that we're trying to figure out is how to build a mind without working memory. But it kind of makes sense to begin with what I think the standard approach is, which is how do you build a mind with working memory? And basically, the idea I have is that Almost every time that we try to figure out how do you build or model a mind, we end up positing something that has the shape and form and function of working memory. So how might you do this if your job is to figure out how to build a mind? Like one option is you can go and you can canvas and observe people's behavior and try to figure out how they, you know, what they're doing in response to stimuli and so forth. You can also introspect, which, you know, philosophers like to do and kind of turn inward, consult the manifest image of mind and what looks to be like essential if you were building this type of thing. And I think in this process, which we've been doing ever since we started doing this business of philosophy, we try to find kind of anchors in our model of the mind that help us explain these cognitive achievements, right, that we can we either internalize and kind of look inward and we're like Descartes in the meditation, or we look outward and we're like, wow, Look at Newton and Leibniz, they figured out the calculus. How did they come up with these cognitive achievements, right? But it's not just Newton and Leibniz and whatnot, and it's not just cognitive achievements that people are looking at when they're coming up with models of the mind. So a couple of things that I'm gonna exclude when I talk about cognitive achievements, I'm kind of taking this Ned Block approach. Um, not that I agree with it, but I think it's useful. And what I mean by that is I'm not talking about predominantly perceptual achievements, like the work that, for instance, Chaz Firestone's done or Jorge Morales about how perceptual systems work. I'm not really talking about motoric systems. I think we've actually done a lot of good progress in this work. I'm really more concerned with this, how do we make sense of these cognitive achievements, right? Paradigmatic cognitive achievements, things like language and uh, you know, internal speech, external speech. And again, we're trying to find the anchors in our model of the mind to help explain these achievements. We also have problem solving. It's like a classic one. We might also consider reasoning and deliberation. This is, of course, Christ disputing with the doctor. Uh, we might also consider things like coordinated behavior, future planning, and action. These are the kind of paradigmatic cognitive achievements that I think we're trying to capture in our models of the mind. We're trying to basically come up with, ideally, mechanisms that help explain how people can realize these cognitive achievements. So this is kind of the story I think that's been going on. And it's not that unfamiliar. I mean, I think, you know, Hume and in the inquiry does a really nice job of summing up this process. He calls it mental geography, right? So he says something like, and if we can go no farther than this mental geography or delineation of the distinct parts and powers of the mind, it is at least a satisfaction to go so far, right? And I think that's kind of the spirit of what I'm trying to motivate here, that that's what we tend to do when we're coming up with models of the mind. Now, I think there's a problem, a couple of problems with this general narrative. One is that in these mechanisms that we posit to help explain these cognitive achievements, it seems like my bugbear, working memory, keeps popping out. We keep getting something that looks like working memory. That's one thing I'm going to argue. The second thing that I think is a problem is that we have these cognitive achievements. Again, we're looking at, you know, we introspect or we look at behavior and we categorize these cognitive achievements and then we try to come up with mechanisms in the mind of an individual to explain them. And I think a lot of this story tends to leave out the social components that I think are really integral to a lot of these cognitive achievements. So just to kind of recap what I think is a kind of standard narrative and standard standard process in this in this story is something like we have these cognitive achievements we're trying to build a model of the mind that has mechanisms that explain it a lot of these models tend to have something that's just like pluripotent generative synthetic evaluative capacity like working memory and then working memory is then in turn posited as a way to explain these cognitive achievements working memory or its analogs are posited to explain these cognitive achievements in a way that leaves out, I think, important contributions of the social world. And I think this is bad. I don't think we're going to get a satisfactory view of cognition until we kind of fix some of these problems. I'm not going to talk about the second one today. That's less well-formed. 
I have some ideas about it. We can chat about it in Q&A. Uh, and it's going to be the subject of the book, uh, the second half of the book. But I'm going to talk about the first part. I'm going to say, wait, this is bad. Because we know <clears throat> from my previous work that working memory is not a univocal construct. <laughs> and in fact, we might do a lot better if we replace it instead of a kind of univocal construct that's this generative little engine that helps us explain mentation, if we break it down into these candidate constituent pathways that I think are involved in the processes that we attribute to working memory. And these pathways are gonna be different ways that brains and people maintain and manipulate information. You're gonna hear that from me a lot. And I'm gonna basically argue we need to adopt something like a mosaic or a constellation or a coalitional methodology or ontology and methodology to get this story going. Okay, <laughs> that's the overview. So now to dive into some history and basically the claim here, and it's not exhaustive, you know, I think there are counterexamples and I think they're really interesting to consider. In fact, I stayed up really late last night just thinking about one that I thought was devastating, but I don't know, we could talk about it. Too. But in general, I think when people, when scholars look and try to come up with models of mind, they end up positing something like working memory. So I'm just gonna give you a few select cases. So here, of course, we have Aristotle, and with a colleague of mine, Justin Humphreys at uh, Villanova. Oh, whoop, 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 there. With Justin Humphreys at Villanova, we just argued that in fact, Aristotle's view of mentation, specifically his view of fantasia, is kind of the predecessor of working memory, which is kind of a crazy claim. Sorry, I shouldn't say crazy, you know, extreme claim. So I'm gonna not go into the details, but I'm gonna kind of give you a sketch of an Aristotelian view of mind. So in Aristotle, you know, he posited these various components of the animal and human soul or the mind. One of them is the different senses. There's five plus the common sense, right? And they receive impressions from the world. Depends how literal you are about it, but those impressions then are retained in the senses. Uh, so for example, you might see a beer. And so the senses help you, you know, the visual sense and the, the olfactory sense help you and the tactile sense help you like perceive the object as a target of those senses, and the common sense helps to kind of come all together. And then you have something called thought. Now thought has many components, but one special component in Aristotle's view of thought is called fantasia. And fantasia, or kind of loosely translated as the faculty of imagination, helps you imagine future possibilities. It helps you imagine and retain information that was just recently experienced. It helps you form memories. It helps you dream. It helps you in fact, Aristotle claims that there is no thought that occurs without a phantasma. So fantasy is like the arena in which thought occurs. And especially if you're like Jessica Moss, you think fantasy is what helps you see the apparent good in things. And that's really important because, you know, you're Aristotelian and you want to make sure you track the good. So fantasy helps you realize, ah, beer, it's good. And then it conducts locomotion, gives you the objects of desire, and then you actually act in such a way to achieve those ends, right? So this is kind of the Aristotelian object. Okay, importantly here, as I mentioned, thought has this component of fantasia. Fantasia looks a lot like working memory. Why? Well, you can read the paper, but basically it retains images from previously experienced. It helps you synthesize new possibilities. It helps you plan for future action. It helps you think. In fact, you can't think what happened. Okay, cool. Later on, we actually have folks like Ibn Sina, the Persian philosopher and polymath, uh, who posit models that are slightly more, I guess, anatomically based. So Ibn Sina was a fan of updating Dahlin's ventricular model of the mind. Ah, is it breaking? No, uh, ventricular model of the mind. So these people, you know, dissected a bunch and they found that there were these holes in the brain. And what's really interesting is that they were full of fluid, especially for dead people. The fluid was actually kind of a little goopy. And what's really cool is that the fluid actually got harder Oh. It got harder, like it got more tacky as you went down to the back, the, the more uh, posterior ventricle, right? And they actually use that to help come up with a theory of cognition, right? So the ventricles were thought to house these animal spirits and humors. The ventricles at the front of the brain were in charge of kind of sensory activity. So they would hold the impressions that you just received. They're like iconic memory. Then if you notice, there's actually a special uh, ah, a special little uh, thing, it's called the vermis. So th th sometimes they posited like a little worm that's like the gatekeeper between the ventricles. 
that then allows their sensory information to go into the faculty of cognition or imagination. That's where you can do things like plan for future events, retain information to synthesize it with other ideas, evaluate, judge, think, do all that kind of stuff. And then sometimes that information that was deemed really important could get ported into the, the driest ventricle. And since it was the driest, it was the least subject to change. And so it would retain it as a memory. And this was the ventricular view, which was very popular right up until, oh, well, the 1500 Vasilius and other people who were like, bro, it's not the ventricle. Um, okay, but then later on, sorry, it's kind of glitchy. We have people like William James. I'm skipping a lot here. And James, of course, is an associationist, so he's trying to figure out the principles, associations, and elements in the mind that help explain behavior. He doesn't quite have the same commitment to uh, this kind of story. Uh, I don't know why it's a little glitchy. Um, but he does posit something called primary memory. And he thinks primary memory is this thing that basically helps him bridge the recently experienced past, sorry, the recently experienced past to the present in preparation for action. It's the arena where attention selects things, puts it in there, and it kind of helps you explain your conscious horizon. It helps you explain how you might retain things in order to problem solve, in order to think of future possibilities. So we have this capacity of primary memory. Um, later on, I think if we're jumping forward another 100 years, you have the rise of what's called mathematical psychology. This is in response to B.F. Skinner. These are people like Bob uh, Atkinson, no, sorry, uh, uh, Atkinson and Bob Schifrin. And they posit the first information theoretic information processing model of mentation. And this was actually like Scientific American, 1971. And here it is. You get sensory input. So you see like a beer. That gets put into these registers that are set coded for senses. Attention and pattern recognition allow it to go into what they call the temporary short-term store or a working memory which was actually ripped from Newell and Simon, so we can talk all about that interesting history. There, various processes go on. This is also where they think consciousness occurs. And then some information can be encoded into long-term memory, and it's through working memory that you get response, output, and behavior. So it's a lot, basically, cognition is uh, that. It's working memory, right? Uh, and in fact, what's really interesting, I'm not the first to point out, many people have, that there's a lot of parallels between this kind of contemporary information theoretic information processing account and the ventricular models of the past. In fact, it's almost identical. It's like the serial processing of information to help explain behavior, which is pretty cool. Okay. What's the argument here? It's like most models of mind have something like this pluripotent generative capacity that bridges the recently experienced past to the present to help you solve problems. It's the arena where thinking occurs. It's basically the analog, plus or minus a little bit, of working memory. There is a counterexample we can talk about a little bit more, and that's Gall and Spitzheim's like, early phrenology that had no horizontal faculties but had vertical faculties, so we can talk a little bit about that, because I don't want to say I'm a Gallian, but maybe I am. Okay, that's the history. So, moving on. <clears throat> what is this thing that you say, Javier, is in all these models of the mind, like working memory? Well, most of you probably know, but I'll give you the refresher. In fact, quick x moment. How many people feel like they really know what working memory is? <laughs> All right, great. This is great. <laughs> then I'm happy I included it. So working memory, what the hell is it? <laughs> uh, well, back in the day, uh, like in the 20th century, you might have a phone number or a piece of information you have to retain. So somebody might tell you, oh, call me later. My phone number is 1-212-817-8615. That's it. That's a number, actually. <laughs> um, and you, back in the day before we had you know, computers in our pocket, you had to figure out how do I hold this in mind long enough to find a pen to write it down. And if you were a kid, you might actually say it out loud, but most adults basically would rehearse this using inner speech or sort of voce. And you kind of, while you find a pen and a piece of paper, you'd rehearse, you'd say, one, two, one, two, eight, one, six, eight, seven, eight, one, seven, eight, six, one, five. And if Edward bumped into you and asked you how your latest paper was going, you might actually forget that if you don't keep that active process of maintaining and rehearsing in mind. That's the classic kind of 
sense of working memory. Nowadays, I think it's maybe more like the code you get for verifying your like identity. But even that now just auto-populates. So like, actually I had a student who wanted to work on a paper where they're like, maybe working memory was just a fragment of how we processed information in the 20th century. And maybe we don't have it now. I don't know, that's an interesting idea. I told them to work on it. Um, okay, but anyhow, it kind of corresponds to this intuitive sense that we have a capacity that helps us bridge the recently experienced past to the present. That's ripped basically from William James, who was of course a great writer. But we are scientists or you know, lovers of science, so we need to operationalize that. That's not gonna cut it for our any NIH grants. So I'm gonna offer this as a kind of general, the consensus view of working memory in the psychological literature. There are differences we can quibble about, but in general, almost every theory or every paper on working memory trots out something like this view at the beginning, almost in the first paragraph. They say, working memory is very much classically studied. It is our ability to maintain or manipulate limited information no longer in the environment for short durations and the service of goal-directed behavior. Again, people quibble. Some people say it's it's actually only maintenance or only manipulation, and it's actually only five things of information, and it's actually only for four seconds. So, you know, you can quibble about it, but that's how you get tenure in psychology. You come up with a theory that just changes a few things, and there you go. Okay, so why do you care? Why, especially as philosophers, why do we care? Well, if you're a psychologist, I think this is kind of important for you, especially if you're a cognitive psychologist. Actually, at Purdue, they have a very large uh, IO, like industrial organizational psychology department. And there they get oodles of money trying to figure out how to develop gamified working memory tasks to make kids smart. Like, and of course it doesn't work because it's just like a game, a Tetris game. I mean, a Tetris game can't, you can play it, you get good at Tetris, but you're not gonna get good at calculus. Um, but they got tons of money. So there's a lot at stake here. Okay, if you're Alan Baddeley, who's credited, I think for interesting reasons we can talk about later, for popularizing the most common model of working memory, there's a lot at stake. So he says in his book, working memory is assumed to be a temporary storage system under attentional control that underpins our capacity for complex thought. That's a lot. That's basically the panacea model. It's like, you know, you go to the grocery store to pick out limes for a margarita. You gotta know where the limes are. You have to be able to recognize the limes. You have to be able to go and figure out which one are the ripest limes. You have to remember how many limes do I need. Then you have to remember what you're doing. All of that, a current processing happens in working memory for somebody like that. It's really the arena where a lot of active thought for problem solving is happening. <laughs> okay. But it's not just psychologists. So philosophers have recently gotten into the mix here. This is just a warning. Don't put embarrassing pictures of yourself on the internet. You'll never find them. <laughs> so here's Peter Carlos, who actually, dear friend, I do really like him. I, I think his work is excellent. He's one of the first philosophers who's really taken working memory seriously. And in a 2015 or 14 paper, he argues, he says, it seems then that many philosophers are committed to the view that the mind contains a central workspace, like a little whiteboard in the head, in which concepts can be freely combined with one another, in which attitudes of all type can become active, engaging with one another with systems of inference and decision making. So it's like philosophers committed to this view that we have this like little whiteboard in the head that does a lot of work. And he says, ha ha, there is actually such a magic little whiteboard in the head. There is a central workspace in the mind whose contents are additionally always conscious. This is so-called working memory, which has been heavily studied by scientific psychologists for 40, now 50 years. So just to kind of summarize where you see this kind of connection between psychological tasks or cognitive achievements is the word I've been using and working memory and philosophy, you see kind of start to crop up more and more. So, it's been taken, and here is actually, you guys can, everybody can yell at me, because I'm not sure, one of the reasons I came to the center is I, I don't know if I actually have a good view of what the explanation is, or if I even need explanation yeah. here. Like, people have really yelled at me about explanation. So maybe this is not the right word, but working memory is definitely really strongly connected in this way that feels explanatory to things like first, or, oh, first order theories of consciousness. So this is uh, your classic views, like global workspace views, by DeHaan and Akash, attention-based views, like especially if you're thinking of like access consciousness or inner theories, reflective accounts of deliberation. So Peter Carruthers' own view, Aristotle's view of becoming the phronimos requires, you know, fantasia to see the apparent good and to train yourself with indoxa to do the right thing, blah, blah, blah. 
You see, I drink the aerosol. Uh, dual system models of reasoning. So these, these were popular about 10 years ago, but Stanovich and Evans basically said, stop it. Everybody's got a model of dual system reasoning, you know, hot, cold, evolutionary, new, old, male, female, whatever. They said it's basically just some stuff requires working memory. We'll call that system two, and everything else is system one. So that's kind of how they partitioned it. Jen Nagel, in her view, has used a lot of working memory to kind of make sense of these claims. And then my good friend Devin Curry has used it to talk about general or fluid intelligence, or G. So working memory correlates to a lot of these kinds of cognitive achievements that we have. Okay. In my view, okay, we're only 20 minutes in. Let's not do that. Am I going too fast? Yeah. Okay. Working memory doesn't explain or do whatever explanation is, or it doesn't do the thing we want it to do for these things. Rather, it kind of just re-describes. Oops. It re-describes <laughs> our chemistry. So I, that, that's what I argued in this paper, which I, I'm writing a kind of follow-up to it that's way overdue for wires, that is supposed to explain the same argument for, for psychologists without the use of natural kinds. So if you want to help me with that, I'd be very happy to do that. Anyhow, so what's the... I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through the nitty-gritty parts of the paper, though I can. I have a whole slide deck on that. But I'm just going to give you an overview of the dilemma that I think working memory models or contemporary, contemporary working memory models are in. So remember, working memory, one thing is that there's no theoretical unity. Everybody's got their own view. In general, over the history of working memory in the last 50 years, it's gone from a unitary system, like a single thing, where like everything happens in one magic box, to being decomposed into various... I'm not kidding you, Battle, I call them master and slave components. So, you know, and then more recently in neuroscience, it's really kind of a, a state-based model is what's popular by Ken Overhour and Nelson Cohen. So we don't really have a theoretical unity. If anything, it's kind of getting more and more fragmented, which I think is good. But all these models are tied together by the kind of functional commitment that working memory is supposed to maintain and manipulate information. And remember, that's the operationalization that we offered earlier. And that kind of forces a bit of a dilemma. Ha, well, turns out psychologists are very good at determining what maintenance and manipulation are. So we can do the philosophical trick of kind of taking it very broadly or very, very narrowly. If we go very broadly and say like, okay, working memory is just when you have this maintenance of information for goal-directed behavior, yeah, we can limit it in various ways, but it's just, you know, holding stuff in mind to do stuff with. It turns out that that's all over the cortex. So there's actually a lot of really good uh, fMRI data and EEG data from John Dylan Hayes lab in Berlin and Thomas Piscopo lab, where they basically show wherever a so-called, again, this is how neuroscience, not neuroscience is talking, wherever a mental representation is created in the brain, there it can be maintained during working memory tasks, which makes sense. Why would you not, why would you redouble your capacities? If you can produce a representation somewhere, there it can be maintained. So it turns out they have this beautiful map in the macaque and the human. You can represent stuff all over the cortex. And it also turns out that there's many mechanisms that realize this kind of maintenance of information. And that's not surprising because maintenance, when you think about it, holding information for during some period of time is just like a common computational fa fact of life. If you're a system, that consumes and produces information that exists over time, you have to find a way to maintain that information. Even a state-based vending machine that doesn't have memory registers is gonna, in some sense, maintain the information of how many quarters it got, depending on what state it's in. Maintenance is cheap. The neuron maintains information based on its resting potential. Maintenance is cheap, basically. So we have a bunch of mechanisms that do this. There's classics in neural firing, there's population dynamics, there's silent activity states, we can go on and on. So in this case, if we take it broadly, it just seems that working memory just is like the maintenance of information uh, to do stuff with it for cognition. And that just is like describing a lot of what the brain is doing most of the time. So it's, it kind of drops out. It doesn't really, there's no natural kind. Okay, we can also do what a lot of neuroscientists do now. So this is like Brad Postel, some other people. Uh, and they basically say, no, 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 no. That's, we're going to be messed up. That's short-term memory. Working memory is special. It's actually a much more narrow subset of mechanisms. And it really needs to deal with the prefrontal cortex. Usually. And we're going to call what working memory does manipulation. And it's like, okay, cool. Then you actually look at how these scholars test manipulation. 
And it turns out there's no kind of pre or no kind of a priori view about what manipulation is. It's basically whatever task they want it to be. And when you canvas these different tasks, they're just the very kinds of cognitive achievements that working memory is supposed to explain. Things like problem solving, maze solving, uh, mental rotation, alphabetization, logic puzzles, you name it, there's probably a manipulation task that measures it. And that's kind of interesting. It might be that there's part of the brain that's responsible for alphabetization, totally. But that's not necessarily going to generalize to all the other things we assign to working memory. So in some sense here, what are we doing with working memory? We should just talk about the brain regions that are responsible for these different tasks. There's no sense a priori why those tasks should generalize to this model of working memory that's supposed to underlie human thought or cognition that's broad in nature. So in some sense, like this view is like, yeah, that's fine, but then working memory ain't gonna be this magic box that solves the whole cognition. It's just whatever helps you alphabetize. And in this view, oh, it is the magic box that helps you solve cognition, but it turns out it's just a gigantic disjunction of what the brain does. So you see, it doesn't really do much work, which is kind of funny. So it doesn't explain, I think it really just re-describes a lot of our views about these tasks. And more importantly, I think that Working memory in a lot of these, I'm, I'm trying to argue this in a separate paper, working memory in a lot of these other cognitive constructs, like executive function, um, certain kinds of attention, uh, cognitive control, they just are kind of talismans to tell us that there's something cognitive going on. Working memory just redescribes a bunch of commitments we have about what cognition should be like. That's what would I think, and we can talk more about that if there's historical reason for that. But, but whatever it is, it's not doing that, that story we talked about earlier, remember? The story we talked about is that we see these cognitive achievements, we posit things in the brain, we posit our mental geography, and then the way our mental geography works is supposed to help explain that process, right? But what I've tried to show is that we can't posit something like working memory, because there is, Basically, all we're doing is we're just re-describing the commitments we already have about what cognition does, often without mentioning the social work that's very important to many of these cognitive tasks. Okay, cool. 30 minutes. That's not too bad. So I can kind of slow down. Sorry. Okay, so I, I mean, I can also talk about what I think happened. That's a really interesting historical argument. Uh, but it would take us kind of far off track. If you're part of the reading group of the fellows, that's kind of the paper I'll be presenting there. I'm going to talk less about that and more about what we should do. What's a positive picture? So, like, how bad is it? What, what can we do? Well, I think there's two steps we have to take to motivate this positive view. So one possible step that we could take is to adopt something that I've kind of turned, but I have to write a paper that really flushes out. It's this idea of productive pessimism. So what the hell is productive pessimism? Well, here I was actually inspired by Tycho Brahe. So everybody knows Tycho Brahe, right? He's one of the last naked eye astronomers. He was Danish, he had a silver nose. He apparently had a, like, a slave who was a gesture, so it's kind of bad. Um, and remember, he was really rich, so he had all the fancy instruments and he managed to compile so much data about the solar system. However, he had a geocentric view. And he, was, he jealously guarded his data, which he systematized in a beautiful way from Kepler, who wanted the data. Because Kepler, of course, had a different model. And he thought if he had the data, he could show that his model better explained the orbits of the various bodies. And, so. and so Kepler poisoned Taco, Tycho to get the data. I mean, you know, technically, that's one possibility. The other possibility is he died at a banquet. But anyhow, <laughs> what I like about this imperfect character is I think that view where you can have constructs that do work that isn't primarily explanatory, but is largely organizational. That's the, that's the kind of thing I want to inherit from Tycho. Like, yeah, he, his model, his data, what did he do? He compiled hundreds, no, tens of thousands of observations. He systematized them. And he tried to use them. He tried to create his, his geocentric model was one of the worst because he was trying to account for all the data. So it had all these weird extra buttons and bobbles, right? So he, we, we shouldn't necessarily try to explain our pre theoretical intuitions or our views, but maybe constructs can be useful in helping us organize the data so that we can test different hypotheses. 
So it's basically productive pessimism means when you have a concept, de downweight its explanatory role, upweight its role in helping us organize data to test other hypotheses. Um, okay, so how might we do that with working memory? Well, remember, it's this kind of thing that's supposed to maintain and manipulate information. So one of the key upshots of my view is that there's actually many ways we maintain and manipulate information. In fact, that's the nice thing. We don't have to throw away any of the neuroscientists, uh, any of the science, because all they've done is look at these different ways to maintain and manipulate information. And you know what? That's not even new. If people actually paid attention and went back and read the old, the old views of working memory, they'd see that this was the story all along. And it dropped out. And I think there's cool reasons for that. So if you go back to plans and the structure of behavior, one of the first texts where they ripped working memory from Newell and Simon's logic theory machine, where it was just basically a, 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 a register where like information could be stored and the machine had infinite many of these things. And they basically are like, how do we become like computer science? And they take working memory and they try to use it to explain human behavior. It's the first psychological treatment. And in it, they have this beautiful couple that it's all over the place. So here they have a, a, a quote. They say, Richard, the kind of working memory that people prefer to use when they're executing a plan, which is basically like this operation, this program, seems to represent a characteristic by which they mean like characterological, like, like difference in personality, difference. One person will insist on writing things down, writing his life from a calendar pad, whereas another person will keep in his own head everything he intends to do. They basically already have a portal view of working memory. And they reiterate this. They actually say working memory might be in the frontal cortex. They actually even say in the primary frontal cortex, we probably have a working memory, but we equally have a working memory in a notepad. They kind of have a pre-auto view extended mind view. So this plural view is not, it shouldn't be that surprising. So what's the pessimistic bit? Well, the pessimistic bit is that this isn't going to explain cognition. In fact, if I'm right, it just kind of redescribes our commitments about cognition. But that's okay. Think about other things like perception. Perception breaks down into all these different processes, all these modules, all these systems, subsystems. But we're never kind of scratching our heads to think, wait, wait, what does perception explain? That's like a another kind of uh, uh, part of the of the mental model. So I think like kind of leaving out this explanatory move is not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, so what's productive about taking this pessimistic attitude? Well. If working memory just kind of is a bag of terms that, or sorry, if it's just an umbrella concept that pulls together these different ways we maintain and manipulate information, and if it just redescribes our commitments about cognition, then by elimination, we can just say, hey, maybe cognition is partially understood, or one way to understand it is in these different ways we maintain and manipulate information. Cut out the middle. Okay, so how might that look like? Well, this is the next step we can start to investigate those ways that we maintain and manipulate information, right? Because in some sense, we're not, we don't have to say, hey, scientists, you were wrong. Abandon your life dreams. Throw away all the research. Remember, just like Taika Rahe, they've been like categorizing all this information, maybe the wrong models. So what we can do is we can look at the information they categorize. So this is how I had it like in my dissertation. And uh, this is kind of where it was until like a few years ago. My dream was that we could take all the working memory papers, we could put it through magical machine learning, and out we could get those different pathways that we maintain and manipulate information. How easy, right? I was like, it's right there. Of course, I tried to do this, and I was like, no, I forgot. I took, like, calc for business majors, so this is probably not going to be me doing it. Uh, and ideally, my, my real dream is that once we isolate these pathways that maintain and manipulate information, we can start to determine, are there computational differences between them? So here I'm really motivated. Oh, let me tell you a story. I was a postdoc at Penn. I was working in part with a roboticist, Dan Kodacek, and I told him what I did. He's like, what do you do? And I said, oh, working memory. He's like, what's that? And I was like, well, it's this thing that helps me maintain and manipulate information. And he's like, what? Like, Javi, like a vending machine does that. What are you talking about? Come back when you have something I can put in a robot. And I was like, ah. Oh. So in some sense, I'm really intrigued to be like, can we extract a computational story about the different ways that brains maintain and manipulate information such that we can see some of those stories might actually be competing hypotheses of, of systems that maintain and manipulate information. 
and we could then actually implement them in like artificial creatures, robots, or simulate them and see how well those creatures perform in different environments that have different working memory tasks. I think this is a way more informative way to go. This is my dream. Now, <laughs> gotta change the for Elmo. Uh, with Elmo, Python is actually a grad student at Cincinnati. He's also working in data analytics. Um, he's on the market. So yeah. <laughs> if you want a really good postdoc, I would strongly recommend reaching out to Elmo. Uh, Elmo saw me get this talk and he's like, oh, I've been working on this stuff. It's called topic modeling. We can use it to do your dream. And we actually went to SNAP for this little term. And then um, we got some money from them and they're like, hey, here's some money, go try to do this thing. Okay, so here, let me get in and give you the scaffold and I'll tell you why it's bad. We use this thing called JSTOR Consulate, which has 100,000 full text papers. So it's a big bag of word of all these papers with metadata assigned to it. Why? Because if you remember poor Aaron Levy, the poor kid from MIT who tried to scrape a bunch of papers from science and went on and, you know, fortunately passed away. Uh, we wanted to not get into legal trouble. And it's actually really hard to get this data. So we had to go through avenues that already had the text from all these papers. Sorry. Uh, then we use uh, top modeling, specifically latent Dietrich allocation, which basically take that big bag of words and it assigns uh, two different kinds of probability. So you say we want X amount of topics to extract from this bag of words, from this giant set of papers. And then what it does is it runs this model iteratively. So it says, okay, I'm gonna get 30 topics. It then creates a topic, which is just a list of words. And then for every word in a given document, it assigns a probability to which that word belongs to a given topic. So, you know, if you have 30 topics, it assigns each word in each document, 30 probabilities to see which topic it loads on the most. And conversely, it also assigns probabilities to the papers, so to each document, tell you which doc, which topic does that document load on the most. We can get into the nitty gritty, but I'll have to put up this paper next. Uh, and that enables us using this one program about model the models to come up with very cool visualizations of the topics, which are basically the kinds of, uh, 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 they're like words that help predict other words in a corpus. So if we have 30 topics, they're the kind of co-occurring words that help predict uh, which papers best load on those topics, it gets a little more in the weeds than that, but basically gives you a, a deep reading of the literature. You're able to take a huge amount of literature and look at these patterns, especially patterns that change over time and so forth. So they've done some of this work actually. So uh, here, Colin Allen did it, where they looked at uh, Darwin's notebooks because he kept a notebook of everything he was reading. And so they were able to create a topic model based on the books he was reading and they were able to explain whether or predict whether he was in an exploratory phase or in like a exploiting phase in terms of research. But lots of people have done this. In fact, there's a whole book that was published by University of Pittsburgh Press. I have one of the few copies that looks at topic modeling in philosophy of science. So it's what we're trying to do, it's just not really been done in neurosciences. Okay, so we're about 40 minutes in, that's perfect. We get these nebulous constructs that we have intuitions about. We can feed them through topic modeling and we can extract topics from the literature of that kind of help cleave apart the bibliographic space of that literature and tell you which topics predominate and help you explain what are the main or help you see and isolate trends in the literature. It's a little bit more in the weeds now. Let me give you kind of motivating examples. So if you just looked at episodic memory here, we just looked at 10,000 abstracts from PubMed, which is another freely available resource. And what we got was this. So what is this? Well, the different blobs or different colors, each node in that graph represents a topic. The colors represent clusters of topics. The edge, you can tell what the topics are. These have actually been given human labels. So the topics are just huge, like a list of like 20 words. But you can kind of then give it these term of art labels. So that it's not really, it's somewhere between a science and an art where these papers all seem to relate on the hippocampus. These were in cortical regions involved in memory, semantic interactions with memory, effects of repetition of recall, and training and age effects on memory. The edges represent how many papers are shared by any two topics. And you can actually change the, the limits on it. So I think this was 200. So that means if you have an edge, that means there's 200 papers shared that load on the topic that are shared between the two topics. So it allows you to kind of visualize these trends in the literature. 
Uh, now, what's interesting is that the full map kind of looks like this. So you have all the kind of cortical stuff happening, hippocampus, cortical stuff, uh, effects of repetition and recall. And then on this other side, now it doesn't matter, the spatial relations don't really matter. It just matters that there are no edges between them. You have Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, schizophrenia, depression, and effects of aging on memory. They all basically talk, all these papers load on the same topics. So they're kind of shared. You have the literature that's shared. And very few papers are shared across this, these topics. So that basically tells you that the literature can be divided into two main, at least from this sample, can be divided into two main uh, kind of communities or, or discussions. So it helps you visualize these kinds of trends. So what happens when we do that with working memory? Can we extract these met ways to maintain and manipulate information? So here's our nebulous construct. Here's the fancy representation, which I like to call a mosaic model. And here's what it actually looks like. So this, importantly, 10,000 papers, full text papers from JSTOR console. So that'll, we'll come back to that. So what do we have? Well, we have here functional neural correlates of memory, animal models, more animal models, visual working memory, junk. So this was, we had to kind of go in and, and, and determine what that was. It's basically papers that have a lot of citations of working memory papers in the bibliography, but themselves aren't about working memory. So it depends on how you treat this. You can add what are called stop words. Some people say you should, some people say don't. There's a lot, there's, it's a bit of a wild west situation here. It kind of upsets me as somebody who comes from a psychological background who wants to have like pre-registrations and stuff. Um, and then you have these educational theories of working memories, how working memory is affected by society and stress, develop, working memory and child development, it's connected to ADHD, clinical methods, schizophrenia, and verbal and motor impairments. And for a different paper, I, I really thought this was useful because it illustrates something I think is true about working memory, that it has, it's, it's what I call a Janus construct. It has subpersonal processes and personal level processes. Don't worry too much about that if you don't know what that means. But I think it's interesting that you can kind of see that pattern of the subpersonal stuff and the person level stuff in the literature. And in fact, even the person level terms that working memory is instituted in go from like individual with like individual motor impairments to like societal effects, which I think is a cool pattern that you can extract. Cool, it's called. No, um, <laughs> remember what we wanted were computational differences. And these are not computational differences. What? Like this is, you can't build a robot with any of this stuff. Like this is just kind of so bird's eye view and so coarse grain that you can't really, really what we need to do is we're gonna have to figure out how to really zoom in on these islands, the like functional nerve correlates of memory. So basically we need better data. We need better papers. And then we need to have maybe even a different model to help just zoom in just on these curated islands where people are looking at how working memories realize in animals and humans, right? Like what are the actual mechanisms? So we're almost done. <laughs> so other things, again, the whole thing is riddled with problems, uh, which are opportunities if you have money. Well, you. Uh, so one thing is JSTOR console. Great, guess what? Most of the largest neuroscience uh, journals are not in JSTOR console. Neuroimage, it's El Salvier. Like they just, this is really like humanity stuff. So we're not getting a lot of that uh, neuroscience work that we need to kind of characterize it. One thing I want to do is talk to Yao Takoni, if you know Neurosense, he has all these uh, like 10,000 papers on fMRI and different cognitive constructs. I want to get the IDs of those papers, pay somebody to download them, you know, legally, and then create my own little corpus. That costs a lot of money. So that's, I think, a goal. Topic modeling might not be the right tool here. It's an unsupervised technique. It's pretty dumb. We might want something that's a little more curated. We might want to like look at different software combinations. We're also using model of models, which is a nice off the shelf system that helps you create these models. It has a lot of limitations. It'd be great to build our own bespoke thing. In my dream, we could actually go and say, let's filter by the tool. How do the different pathways for maintaining and manipulating information look if we just look at fMRI? If we look at EEG, if we look at animal studies, like do they overlap, do they not? And that's not stuff we're gonna get in now. Okay, we're almost done. So you might also argue, Javi, stop. You haven't killed working memory. <laughs> and why? Well, Peter and Till 
have I presented stuff like this to them before, and they're like, wait, 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 stop. <laughs> okay, we buy the story. Working memory has these different pathways that maintain and manipulate knowledge. But what if one of them is special? What if one's really special? And so Peter wants this to be, he's coming up with a new theory he calls quasi-actions, which are these mental intentional states. But uh, Till has this other view where he really cares about cognitive control. Basically, it's like, what if there's one special pathway for maintaining and manipulating information that's really under our voluntary direction that we can use to scaffold the kind of cognitive resources we have to solve a problem? And that's like voluntary and intentional and special. Honestly, like, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, sure, whatever, have it. But I'm like, maybe I'm giving him too much. I don't know. That's a genuine problem. Okay. So the last few, last minute, really, I kind of want to come back to the story because I didn't tell you how to build a mind without working memory. I just kind of told you this history and why working memory is bad. So how might we do this? Well, remember the original story. We go about, we survey the world, we find these cognitive achievements, and then we posit this internal thing that looks a lot like working memory that helps explain it. But I'm saying there isn't such a magic box. Rather, there's these going to be the, oops, there's going to be these coalitions of ways that brains and creatures working together maintain and manipulate information. So language might be subserved by one specific coalition coalition of ways we maintain and manipulate information. Problem solving by another. Uh, coordinated action by a third. And these might overlap. They might change over the lifespan. They might be trainable. What I'm trying to offer is a way richer approach to try to solve some of these thorniest issues of cognition. And that focuses on really respecting the plurality that brains and creatures have to maintain and manipulate information. Cool, thanks. We'll take a two minute break and then we'll uh, uh, continue. Thanks. Thanks.